On June 7th, 1882, a couple of guys were chilling on top of Pikes Peak in Colorado. The weather was not ideal. Dark clouds were slowly coming in towards them, and snow began to blow all around. But it wasn't a huge deal. These guys were experienced. They had been on the mountain in severe weather before. But suddenly, things began to change. The rocks began to buzz. Sparks of light came out of the mountain's surface. An aurora-like glow surrounded them. A few individuals even saw cones of light coming from their fingertips, and halos surrounded the cuffs of their wet coats. You would think it would be painful, but it wasn't. They couldn't feel anything. They just saw light all around them. But as quickly as it began, it stopped. The blowing snow died down, and with it, so did this strange electrical phenomenon. Now, you might be like, <laughs> Jake, you're making this up. It's not real. This couldn't have happened. Lights glowing from fingertips. No, it actually happened. Like this legitimately happened. In fact, I have proof that it happened. Something very similar occurred as recent as 2016 and it was caught on video. A couple of individuals were hanging out on a frozen lake in January in Wisconsin and they noticed the exact same thing blue coned lights emitting from their fingertips. And it even had the buzz sound, just like the guys on Pikes Peak back in the 1800s. It's, it's a real thing. So what the heck is going on? Well, it's actually a super rare case of a phenomenon known as St. Elmo's Fire. And St. Elmo's Fire is just one of many different electroplasma related phenomena that we are talking about in today's video. If it emits some sort of light, then we're gonna talk about it, okay? So we're gonna talk about basic stuff like lightning and aurora, but we're also gonna talk about some of the stranger, rarer electrical phenomena, such as ball lightning or earthquake lights or Steve. What the heck is a Steve? Well, we're gonna find out. Let's get into the video. And let's actually start off with the one that we are very familiar with, lightning. Lightning is a series of massive electrostatic discharges caused by a separation of positive and negative electric fields. Large storm systems contain small ice crystals that can smash and bounce off of each other. This then causes a buildup of electric charges. These charges separate into many different positive and negative electric fields, both within the cloud and between the cloud and the ground. This separation of different electrical charges will eventually lead to an electrostatic discharge. And when this happens, the air is heated up to 30 thousand degrees celsius this extreme heat leads to the ionization of air molecules thus creating plasma and a bright flash of lightning the air also rapidly expands and creates a shock wave known as thunder lightning wait for the thunder Let's talk about different lightning types. The most common form of lightning is sheet lightning. These are intercloud lightning strikes that are hidden, so they just look like flashing clouds. When you see sheet lightning or cloud flash lightning off in the distance on the horizon, it may actually be a case of heat lightning. Heat lightning is often referred to as silent lightning or dry lightning, and it's simply lightning that is too far away to be heard by the observer. There are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to heat lightning. People think that it's caused by heat because they tend to see them during the summer nights, um, but really, that's all it is. It's just lightning that's too far away to be heard. Another type of lightning is fork lightning. Fork lightning is a negative strike that has several branches or forks, kind of like a river. Fork lightning also tends to flicker, and this is due to negative lightning having multiple return strokes. Return strokes, by the way, occur when a stepped leader reaches an upward streamer. Once they make contact, all of the electricity can flow, and boom. That's a return stroke. Smooth channel lightning, on the other hand, is a positive ground to cloud lightning strike that has no forks. These are less common than negative fork lightning, and they only have one bright flash or return stroke, but they tend to be very powerful and very loud. When you're super close to a strike, you may observe bead lightning. This is the final decaying stage of lightning that shows it dissipating into segments. Bead lightning is not a type of lightning, it's just the name given to the final stage. Ribbon lightning occurs when lightning with multiple return strokes or bolts is blown in high cross winds. This creates multiple parallel lines. Anvil crawlers, sometimes referred to as spider lightning, are those highly impressive, long, horizontal tree-like lightning strikes that occur at the top of cumulonimbus clouds in the anvil. 
They tend to be more rare as the anvil is usually hidden from view. Now those were sort of the main lightning types. However, there are some more obscure, super rare lightning types that I want to talk about. The first one being a super bolt. A super bolt is a lightning strike that is a hundred to a thousand times more powerful than a typical lightning strike. Typically, the amount of energy a lightning strike has is about 1 to 5 gigajoules. However, a super bolt is anywhere between 100 to 1000 plus gigajoules. In fact, these flashes are so bright that the Vela satellites are able to pick them up, which are meant for detecting the flash of an atomic bomb. So here's a question. Can lightning occur under a clear blue sky? Well, kind of. This is a rare instance of lightning known as clear air lightning or a bolt from the blue. These are anvil clouded ground strikes that extend far beyond their parent storm, sometimes over 10 miles. This particular example occurred over 46 miles away from its parent storm. If you're chilling, you know, amongst the hills within a valley, the sky above you might be blue, but a storm could be hidden out of view behind a hill. If a lightning strikes horizontally out of that storm and over into the valley, it could appear as a bolt from the blue. Lightning has also been known to appear during volcanic eruptions within the volcanic plumes. There have even been reports of green lightning inside volcanic plumes. However, the existence of true green lightning is controversial. So those were your main types of lightning and some of your more obscure types of lightning. But now let's talk about the rarest of rare lightnings, ball lightning. So what is ball lightning? Well, it might not even be lightning. Essentially what it is, is it's a glowing ball of plasma. However, unlike lightning, it doesn't last for a split second. It can last for several seconds or even several minutes. Usually ball lightning is yellow, orange, or red, and sizes tend to be between four and eight inches in diameter, but sometimes they're as small as a quarter and other times they're as large as eight feet. Sometimes it appears stationary up in the clouds, and other times it meanders along the streets a few feet from the surface, slowly traveling down the road. It has also been known to appear indoors. Reports claim that ball lightning has a sulfuric smell to it, and that sometimes it dissipates, and sometimes it explodes. There's no confirmed images of ball lightning. However, there are many supposed pieces of footage. Brett Porter took this photo of what he claimed to be ball lightning in Queensland, Australia in 1987. But yeah, it's a little bit hard to tell what's going on here. Since we don't have any confirmed footage, we must go off of historic testimony. There are all sorts of stories about ball lightning. There's stories of it coming down chimneys. There's stories of it going through windows, like the window didn't break, it just went through the window. In one instance on August 8, 1975, a large thunderstorm came over Worley, England. One family was just hanging out in the kitchen when suddenly they noticed a strange ball of light appear over the stove. The ball was about 10 centimeters and slowly moved towards the father of the family. As the ball approached him, it made a strange rattle sound. Suddenly, the father could feel heat coming from his wedding ring, and right when the ball reached him, it suddenly disappeared. There are some reports of ball lightning killing people. Way back on October 21st, 1638, an absolutely huge eight foot in diameter ball of lightning smashed through the Widecombe and the Moor Church in Dartmoor, England. It smashed through the wall, broke into several different pieces, and then all the pieces left through another window. In the end, four were killed and over 60 were injured. This event has been dubbed the Great Thunderstorm, although I can think of some greater thunderstorms. The existence of ball lightning is controversial. Many scientists don't even believe it exists. You can make the argument that everyone has cell phones, where's the footage? But there's so many different testimonies that have so many things in common, like the sulfuric smell, the buzz. Cultures that aren't even related to each other claim to have witnessed a very similar phenomenon. It seems like a lot of the accounts are from England, so if you are from England, get some camera set up all around your house. Now we have finally made it back to St. Elmo's fire. This was of course the strange thing that happened to our hikers on Pikes Peak and the two at the lake. St. Elmo's fire is the glow of ionized air aka plasma. This glow usually takes the appearance of blue lightning shooting out of ground based objects such as flagpoles, church steeples, or masses on ships. This is a process known as coronal discharge. When you have an electrically charged atmosphere and then specific objects on the ground or even in the sky, if we're talking about a plane, when those have a very different electrical charge, air molecules can be torn apart and this creates plasma and that blue glow. 
Sometimes St. Elmo's fire can occur with blowing snow or sand. Just check out this video. There's a ton of blowing snow from the blizzard and if you look at the lamp post, there seems to be strange sparks occurring. All the friction and all the static buildup from the blowing snow cause some sort of reaction between the electrically charged atmosphere, thus ionizing the air around them. One of the most enigmatic tornado events of all time was the 1955 Blackwell, Oklahoma tornado. Now what's strange about this tornado is that it glowed in the dark. It's very likely that this was a case of blowing dust St. Elmo's fire. And this is exactly what happened on Pikes Peak on June 7th, 1882. It was a mix of your typical St. Elmo's fire on the peak of a mountain and a static electrically charged buildup from the blowing snow. So the video of the people on the lake with their fingertips, there's a couple of interesting aspects to that video. One, it's during January, so it, it is cold. So there might be some sort of blowing snow going on, some sort of ice crystals blowing in the atmosphere, creating some sort of static charge. Two, they're on a lake, so they are probably the tallest thing within several meters beyond. If you notice, when they change, it's like the, the, the finger that's the highest up has the blue beam coming out of it, which is interesting in itself. There are a lot of other videos of this same thing going on, but they're always on mountaintops, and you cannot see the blue light because they're taken during the daytime. In fact, the people taking the videos probably don't know that there could be a blue light on the edge of their fingertips. I wanna see this so bad. I want to capture cones coming out of my fingertips and I'm gonna try to do it this winter. Let me know if you have ever witnessed St. Elmo's fire. Sticking with ionization of the atmosphere, let's talk about auroras. A natural light show primarily located in high latitude zones is the aurora or polar lights. These are produced when the magnetosphere is disturbed by solar winds that ionize and energize the elements in our atmosphere. This then generates light with a range of colors and complexity. The brightest green auroras occur at an altitude of 56 to 100 miles above the surface in the thermosphere. During some very intense solar storms, the rare red aurora can come into view. These occur at a much higher altitude than green auroras, usually about 200 to 300 miles up. Oxygen is way more abundant at those altitudes and that's what gives it that red glow. Since these are so high up, they have been seen at very low latitudes. Major historical events with red aurora include the September 1839 display seen from London and the 37 AD display seen from Rome. Now what on earth is this? Well this is Steve, aka Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. Steve tends to appear with auroras, but it's not a type of aurora. It's a less dense, pinkish red ribbon of light that runs from east to west and extends further south than most auroras. At an altitude of almost 280 miles above the surface, Steve displays pretty high up in the atmosphere. This phenomenon is a little less understood than others, but scientists have noticed a connection to the picket fence aurora. A picket fence aurora is a long and striped pattern that tends to be pretty faint. We're still making aurora discoveries today. In fact, as recent as 2016, a new aurora type was discovered. These are known as dune auroras, and scientists believe that they are influenced by gravity waves. The next group of phenomena that I want to talk about are earthquake lights. These are very strange. In fact, scientists are pretty certain that they do exist, but they have no idea what causes them. There are a few theories though. One theory is that during an earthquake, pockets of gas can escape the surface. These pockets of gas are then released into the atmosphere and somehow they ignite and then you see a fireball. That could be one version of an earthquake light. Another idea is that beneath the surface there's a lot of friction going on and that is creating an electrical charge and similar to St. Elmo's fire, it gets released into the atmosphere and some sort of ionization occurs creating lights and it's possible that these could just be power flashes because when the ground is shaking, things get destroyed and you get bright power flashes. So we're not 100% sure what's going on. A very strange phenomenon indeed. The next category that we're talking about is transient luminous events or TLEs. These include sprites, blue jets, gigantic jets, and elves. Sprites take place in the sky above developing thunderstorms. They have been observed to co-occur and react to positive clouded ground lightning. 
These lightning bolts are so powerful that they can actually ionize the air above them. They manifest as vertical red columns that can reach up to 60 miles above the thunderstorm cloud top. They are pretty faint and they are very quick, so they are very difficult to see unless you know what you're looking for. A second high altitude visual phenomenon are blue jets. These were first documented in 1994 and they are optical ejections from the top of electrically active core areas of thunderstorms. They normally spread out and vanish at heights approximately 25 to 30 30 miles above the thundercloud in narrow cones. Not quite as well known as sprites and blue jets are elves. These are very fast, glowing 300 mile diameter luminous disc shaped halos. They appear over regions of active cloudy ground lightning and they last for less than a thousandth of a second. Elves, according to scientists, are created when a powerful electromagnetic pulse rises into the ionosphere. If you want to know more about TLEs, I highly recommend you check out Paul Smith and Pecos Hank. They have some great videos on YouTube about sprites and blue jets. Check them out for real. All right, let's talk about bolides. Essentially, bolides are bright meteors. Meteors are falling stars, aka shooting stars. They are meteorites going through our atmosphere and burning up. Probably the most famous bolide in history is the February 15th, 2013 Russian fireball. It was bright, it was spectacular. In fact, a huge meteorite actually impacted a lake, so that's pretty cool. Finally, let's talk about those strange spirals in the sky. Those are actually caused by rocket launches, specifically the rockets expelling different fuels or debris at high altitudes. So after sunset, you're in the Earth's shadow and you're just chilling, but way up, way up high in the sky, that's still in direct sunlight. That rocket and its dust and all of its plumes are still in direct sunlight and when they spin a little bit they can create a spiral and that's what you see you see the remnants of a rocket being launched this also creates something known as a space jellyfish they're pretty cool they're a lot more common now that spacex is launching rockets all the time but yeah i have not seen one i'll keep my eyes peeled and that was our list of electrical atmospheric phenomena. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you in the next video.